as um, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, is unity with, you know, within diversity. And when we're all different, it makes that harder. <laughs> um, so, go on. So I just like this picture. It kind of takes us back to the frontier days. But we talked a little bit about this already. We have the believer's baptism emphasizes the freedom of choice. And immersion is the preferred method because it was the, used in scriptural accounts. And even the Campbells, um, like I said, they, they were rebaptized, but there's still conversation now. Well, if you were baptized as an infant by sprinkling um, or pouring, sometimes they're used interchangeably, um, should you be rebaptized? You know, if that, that baptism was still good, but should you have that choice? And so there's still a lot of um, discussion about that. The, like I said, the Campbells decided their whole family would be rebaptized by immersion. Um, that's not required. Um, I know there's some in this church that have wanted to be uh, uh, because they wanted, okay, this is my choice and this is the decision I'm making now. Um, and but there was even discussion even from the beginning about should, should children, should young children, infants be baptized? Well, Paul says um, that, you know, I baptize the whole household. Well, it's, it's pretty safe to assume the whole household includes infants and children. So if we're going back to scriptural and restoring the, you know, first church, that has to be accepted and acknowledged and valued as well. Um, so, immersion is still the preferred method, for, but all baptisms are accepted within our tradition. Um, so those are kind of the big things, but it's about coming together. Uh, like I said, I, I was baptized at age of eight, but I, it was an intentional decision on my part. And many people say, well, that's quite dumb, but I knew what I was doing. I mean, I made that decision, I walked down that aisle, like I said, good Baptist, and I said, I want to be baptized, and it, you know, it was special. Um, you know, typically we try to, you know, in the disciples tradition, um, you know, over 10 or so. Um, usually our, our t you know, youth is typically an age that we, we talk to them about that. Um, but, go on to the next slide. Um, And so we've talked about baptism, we talked about confession, baptism, now we're bridging into the communion table. We have one table, one loaf, one communion. Um, this is how you know, we make and remake covenantal bonds to one another. It's our, our covenant with God, but if, it says if you say you, you know, God, you know, scripture says if you love, say you love God, but don't love one another. And how can that be? And so it's, it's always echoes. Our covenant with God always echoes how we relate with one another. And um, so these are just some fun things. Um, and the ecclesia, we talked about this last week a bit. The ecclesia is the Greek word for the assembly, those that are called out. And it's the word that is translated to church in the New Testament into English. Um, so that's... That's kind of what, why that's there, it's to remind us. And it's those who are called out for a common purpose. Um, so, Campbell especially talked that one loaf, and always having one loaf at communion was important to Alexander Campbell because it signified the one body of Christ and the one body of Jesus. I mean, also to have it be one. One loaf is oneness in Christ. Um, Shanja Jha, um, in her book, I said I've got some further learning things. These are some of the books I've used to put this together. She's talking a lot about um, racial ethnic unity and equality, um, but I think that it, it fits regardless of what that is. Um, and, you know, the, the welcome table, and often you'll hear that in disciples, the, this is the Lord said the communion table is known as the welcome table. It's one table that we all eat from. Um, and she reminds us that everyone should be have the opportunity to talk and eat at the welcome table if it's truly open to all. And um, 
you know, that the world may believe and that they may all be one. Was one of the early cries of the Disciples Church. That's why I put that in connecting, you know, Shanja's, you know, book that came out in the last few years, I think 2011, to our history. That this has been continual for the last couple hundred years. And now this is, you know, next couple slides are going to look like we've got, um, I'm, pr I'm going to book tour for other people, but uh, <laughs> I, I get no royalties whatsoever, I want to make that clear. Um, but there is, um, I think it's really um, important because it's, you know, maintaining and working on right relationships with one another is everyone's duty at the church. Um, we need to work on that, just like we do with family relationships, sometimes those aren't so easy. Um, you know, I'm sure there's always been these family dinners that there's that one cousin or uncle or something that you're not real happy to see necessarily. But we have to work on them because they're family, same in the church. Um, so this comes from this book here, and it's, it's a lot, but I think it's important. And especially we talk about the theology of disciples of Christ. Um... <coughs> There you go. Thank you. And so I'm going to read this probably more quickly than I should, but I want to give us time. You know, the rummage sale and new schedules we've got got started a little bit later. We pray that Patrick found his keys. I was helping that he lost them somehow in the leftover rummage. So, oh, okay. yeah, not a good thing. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So, um, and I'm in this shirt, this is, um, in fact. I'm, I wanted to introduce my necklace. You guys get a preview of the worship service. Um, I went on the youth work trip with them, and I led them through a week of studies about covenant. And one of the things we talked about that is how that the covenant is now written on our hearts. It's not just written on stone tablets, but on our hearts. So every member who was there took a heart bead. Some took different colors, some took one color. And we asked... Um, one another, will you trust me with a piece of your heart? And that's how, so each one of these was taken, you know, one who represents me, and the other ten are the other people who were there with us, and, you know, the, the youth and the sponsors. And so we had to actually give a piece of our heart and trust the other person with that. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. That's your teaser for worship today. Yeah, and so, um, like I said, that's your teaser, but that's, that's kind of why I'm wearing this and the t-shirt. I'm not, you know, it is San Diego in summer, but I normally would be so casual. <laughs> um, but I want to read this because it's important. When we talk about the theology of the disciples of Christ, the hallmarks of, the, of a theology of the disciples of Christ, like the marks upon the body of the Apostle Paul, are dearly bought. Emerging with difficulty from a tradition nearly two centuries old is a radical inclusivity akin to the love of God for all Earth's households. There is a definite orientation towards justice, especially for those who dwell in liminality. In the bonds of Christian faith, they have embraced one another with ties of tenacious love and have fiercely refused the notion that division and segregation are necessary consequences of diversity. In freedom, they have become willing captives to the uncompromising nature of the good news of Jesus Christ that Earth may still be fair, and all her peoples won. And this is Stephen Sprinkle, who's a disciple historian and theologian, who these are the beginnings. And he says, because disciples have yet to write a full-blown covenant theology. That's really what our theology is. And that it hasn't been written down. So he's kind of saying, someone still needs to do that. Some of those people are here now, some are coming to the future, but it needs to be done. But he gives us some really strong words to consider as that happens. So I think this is a great, great start. You got me a new word up there. Liminality? Yes. Yeah, my cell check did not like that. I have never heard of liminality. I think it might be, you know, Stevens. Yeah, I think it means with um, limits. With limits. That, that's how I'm reading it. Okay. And that's how. Okay, that's sort of how I. Yeah. And, and because I don't think it, I think that Sprinkle made it up, <laughs> um, but it's, yeah, um, without limits, you know, unconditional right. would be another way I would say that, so that's how I read it, so yeah, thanks for pointing out, so, because I've never heard of liminality either, right. so I, I'm just saying it like it, 
I know what it is, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's not just me. Yeah. Remember, if you ask the question, there's you know, at least a couple other people that are have that question. Right. But I like, you know, I like what that says about disciples and covenant. Yes. Um, and like I said, this is going to look like the book tour part. But Michael Kinnaman and Jan Lynn. Michael Kinnaman um, is a professor. Has been was dean of Lexington Theological Seminary, where I attend. He's uh, also serves as the secretary for the National Council of Churches. He's very much into ecumenical work. Uh, that is a disciples, um, you know historian and theologian um, and he talks about the covenant of the heart which I think is another reason that my little heart would be necklace that we'll, we'll hear about like I said this is the worship teaser um, and <coughs> that both Michael Kinnaman and Janet Lynn they agree that because it, as disciples we have we have no creed but Christ but you know not that the other creeds that other traditions hold to are wrong but that there's not necessary. Um, that there, you know, it's just about Christ, and it's Christ that brings us together. And it's because of that simplicity, I'm going to say, um, is that there's the practice of equality between clergy and laity in ministry. Laity just means those who are not clergy, okay, who are not ordained ministers, okay? Um, have been shaped in one spirit that makes covenant possible. So because, to me, it's the simplicity. If we just say we are in covenant because of our belief in Christ and not all these other things that sometimes we get brought into, that's how we can be in covenant and in quality and work together and walk alongside even when people may not, you know, we don't agree with one another. And sometimes we may just not like them too much. And that's okay, but we're commanded to love one another. Okay, I know it's, it's a lot, but I want to um, go ahead. Now, I know this is hard to see, but this is basically just my prompt to ask you, what questions do we still, are we still considering about the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, about covenant in that? about the theology, but what does it mean, you know, the, the God study of, you know, covenant? What is that? Scripture, what is that in practice? Because this here is a commission on theology and Christian unity. Still have these questions, and that's all this is, is they're still questioning how can we, you know, you know, are disciples giving the sufficient attention to the role of the divine in, in initiative and covenant? So these are still questions that those that you know, spend their lives and energies and spirits pondering these things, they're still asking questions. And so I assume we're going to continue to ask questions, and that's a good thing. That's also very disciple-like, is to, to ask questions and to consider and read and study, read the scriptures, and read it through the eyes of covenant. I, I challenge us to, to do that. Um, and that may not be the thing you do always for the rest of your life, but it's a way of perspective to look at things. Um, you know, do disciples tend to understand covenant as contractual rather than relational? Do we still need to work on that? So I'm hoping the work here that I'm doing, that my focus here, and with our you know congregation here, um, you know, we we need to be reminded that we are in covenant relationship with one another. Always we do, you know, but, you know, we have gone through lots of changes and lots of uproar in the last few years, and so all the more important as we go through pastoral search and call our settled senior minister, we need to, to practice covenant. We need to use the language of covenant and relationship and community with one another, okay? So, well, we're late, but I want to at least sing one verse, um, of the song that's on the back of your paper there called Weave. Um, and, but I also have a, an evaluation for you to fill out. So I'm going to hand those out as we sing this. But let this song be our prayer. Like I said, we got to start a little bit late. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we must together, we must together. 